Today we are going to do a brief introduction into advanced placement world history. It's a great class and this will give you kind of an intro into what is taught in this class and also give you a little trivia to see how much you know about world history before getting started. I first like to ask people this question. What is the number one problem in the world today? Now, the most common answers that I get to this question are the following, which are all real problems. Poverty, violence, racism or hatred, disease, child abuse, broken homes, drug abuse. These are all real problems in the world today. Um, but I believe that most major problems in the world have an underlying cause ignorance. I think ignorance is the foundational cause of a lot of these other problems which are simply symptoms of being ignorant. For example, violence. Uh, if someone is violent, that's often because they don't know how to solve problems with their words, so they resort to their fists. If someone is a racist or hates a certain group, it's probably because they don't understand that we are all equal. We are all uh, made in the image of God. If someone abuses drugs, they probably don't know, haven't been taught, or haven't learned the harm that drugs do to your body and your mind. So ignorance can cause a lot of really, really serious problems. At its core, ignorance is a lack of knowledge, information, and wisdom. Now notice this doesn't mean stupidity. If you're ignorant, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're stupid. It just means that you have not learned yet. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't learn, it means you haven't, or in some cases, you won't learn. Hopefully that's not the case for any of you, but some people are willfully ignorant. We've already talked about all sorts of problems that this can cause. So I believe that ignorance is the number one problem in the world today simply because it's the root of so many other problems. And really that's why I became a teacher. That's why school is important. That's why we learn. So I like to start with why here, why history is important to learn about. So history in particular, we learn about for several reasons. First off, we study history in order to learn from the past so we don't make the same mistakes as people before us. So we're not doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past because we don't know the past. If you've ever heard someone say, oh, I had to learn that lesson the hard way, that's not because they had a hard history class on it and the test was really, really difficult and they had to study a lot. No, learning something the hard way means they had to experience it and it was painful. So we have this incredible privilege living at the time that we do now to where we can learn from both the mistakes and the successes of people who had come before us. There are billions of people who have lived before us, who have suffered from the same kind of struggles that we do and had similar experiences that we have had and had some of the same challenges. And we get to learn from the attempts of the past, the things that they tried and see if it works. We can learn from the past in order to learn the lessons of history because you're gonna learn the lessons of history one way or the other. Your only choice is, are you gonna learn it the easy way by studying history, or are you going to learn it the hard way by having to experience it yourself? Another reason we study history is to appreciate what we have and where we and our ancestors came from. So many of our modern amenities make us live more comfortable, luxurious lives than even royalty did just 100 years ago. So to appreciate what we have, to have that kind of gratitude is something that really gives good perspective. A third reason we study history is to honor the memory of those who came before us. Uh, most people want to accomplish great things in their life, but then we don't want to just be forgotten about when we die. Uh, therefore, we should remember great men and women of the past who did wonderful things and helped build the world that we all live in today. And then the fourth reason we study history is to better understand who we are. History helps people make better sense of the present. If you've ever seen something on the news and just wonder why is this this way? Well, if you know history, then the present makes a heck of a lot more sense. All right, so here's a trivia quiz for you guys um, just to see how many of these questions you know, to see how well you know world history um, before learning about it uh, in greater detail. So uh, if you need to pause this in order to think about it for a while, go ahead uh, in between each question. But the first question, we're just going to get right into it. 
what two large empires existed in the Americas when the first Europeans arrived? The answer is the Aztec Empire, which was in Mexico, and the Inca Empire, which was in South America, modern-day Peru. Second, in order, what are the four largest religions in the world? The four religions with the most followers. The answer is number one, Christianity, two, Islam, three, Hinduism, and four, Buddhism. Okay, so if you got those in order, extra kudos to you. Next, who changed the world in the 15th century by inventing the movable type printing press? One of the most important people in history, Johannes Gutenberg. Who started the Protestant Reformation in 1517 by nailing his 95 theses to a church door? His name was Martin Luther, really important guy in history. Who abolished the British slave trade, leading to a global abolition movement? Someone we don't talk about nearly enough, William Wilberforce. Who are the two longest reigning monarchs in British history? Two longest reigning kings or queens, that would be Queen Elizabeth II, who reigned for 70 years, and Queen Victoria, who reigned for 64 years. Who were America's three major enemies during World War II? The answer is Germany, Italy, and Japan. What ideology did the U.S. combat during the Cold War? That would be communism, also known as Marxism for Karl Marx. Who helped abolish apartheid in South Africa and then was elected South Africa's first black president? His name was Nelson Mandela. What are the only two wars that the United States has ever lost? That is Vietnam and Afghanistan. According to the U.S. intelligence community, what four nations are the global security threats in the world today? Think, what four nations are the official global security threats in, uh, according to the U.S. intelligence community? Well, first would be China, followed by Iran, North Korea, and Russia. And then, <clears throat> last question, what are the six most populated countries in the world today? Number one is actually India. It recently surpassed China not that long ago. China was the most populated country in the world for a very, very long time. <clears throat> and India recently surpassed it. So second would be China. Both of them have about 1.4 billion people. A distant third is the United States with 340 million, that's 0.3 billion. Indonesia with 280 million. Pakistan with 240 million. By the way, Pakistan used to be a part of India, so just imagine how big India would be if it still was. And sixth is Nigeria with 230 million. That's one of the fastest growing countries in the world by population. And some people think it might surpass the United States by 2050. All right, so the AP exam. To take the AP exam, that's going to be at the end of the school year. And there are several parts to the exam, which we'll get to on the next slide. But this is the breakdown of exam scores uh, from the last year. So the total number of students who took this exam nationwide was just over 300,000 and the number of people who passed it were 170,000. So around 56% of all people who took this exam passed it. And by the way, to pass it, you have to get a three or higher. So if you score a one or a two, that means you don't pass the exam. Now that won't affect your grade in your class, but it will affect whether or not you get college credit for the class. Uh, if you get a three, four, or five, that means not only do you get high school credit, but you get college credit for world history. 
Now for freshmen, this number is even lower. It's not 56% who pass, but it is only 38% who passed. Uh, now last year, about 46% of my freshmen uh, passed it, so still probably not as high as we'd like it to be, but it is a very, very difficult test. Okay? The exam is very hard. It evaluates college level knowledge as well as writing skills. And in this class, we are going to be preparing for the exam all year, okay? With the hopes of you all earning a three, four, or five to earn college credit. So what does the exam look like? Well, there are four parts to it. Three of the parts are writing, and the first one is multiple choice. So with the multiple choice section, there are 55 high-level multiple choice questions. And these aren't simple questions like, who was the first president of the United States? A, George Washington, B, Lincoln, no. These are very complex questions that usually require multiple layers of thinking. They are depth of knowledge to three and four questions, we call them. And most questions will also have a stimulus attached to it, which is either a passage to read or a picture to analyze before you answer the multiple choice question. You get a total of 55 minutes for this section, and it is 40% of your exam grade. The short answer section is next. You get 40 minutes on it. It's 20% of your exam grade. And these are nine different questions that you have to answer in paragraph form. A lot of times they will be grouped into sets of three and those three will be related to each other. But in total you are writing nine responses in paragraph form. So at least three sentences if not more. And um, you get 40 minutes to do that. Third is the documents-based question essay, or the DBQ as we call it. For this one, you get seven historical documents to read. So you read through them, you mark them up if you need to, and then you have a prompt to answer in essay form. So you're answering a question based on the seven historical documents that you read. Uh, you need to write a thesis, you need to gather evidence from those documents, and you need to analyze them in order to prove your argument correct. This is a new kind of essay writing skill for most people who take this class. It is um, very complex and uh, you get a total of 60 minutes to do this one and it's 25 percent of your exam grade. Then the final one is another essay but it does not have documents. It's called the long essay question or LEQ and just like the DBQ you have thesis, evidence, and analysis. You have a prompt to answer an essay form, but no documents to read and get info from, so all of it has to be from your memory. You get 40 minutes on this, and it is 15% of your exam grade. So throughout the year, we are going to cover the years 1200 to the present. This exam that we're preparing for covers the years 1200 to the present, so about 800 years, and that is what the AMSCO textbook that I recommend you all get covers. Um, first, we're going to briefly learn pre-modern history, which is history before 1200, and then um, test our knowledge on that. Then, for the rest of the year, we are going to be in the textbook learning the material that's going to be on the exam, 1200 to the present. We will get all the way to the present day by the start of May, and your AP exam will be in May. 